is going, yes. I just need to put this on and then say welcome back, family Bible time. We are in Acts, Acts chapter 18 and Acts chapter 19. So, first job is to find out which way up to put the Bible. And then find the book of Acts and then we're good to go. So... Acts chapter 18 and Acts chapter 19. Oh, I've forgotten a very important job, which is to rescue my cup of tea. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for um, to giving us daily food. We worship you, Lord, because you, um, you feed your sheep You've given us your word, which is just more wonderful than anything we could ever have imagined. And deeper and more full of uh, truth than anything we could have hoped for. We praise you for it and we pray your blessing upon our reading now. We pray and Lord, we ask you to um, help us, deliver us from evil, please. Um, Teach us through your word. Lead us not into temptation in our thinking. And we pray that you lead us in your truth for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 18. Maybe the uh, puppies just like the Bible and they get excited when the Bible is being read. Can I move this slightly this way? You can still move. You can still... You can still have your feet on it. All right, Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade, there's that word again, Jews and Greeks. Now, a little pit stop to say uh, Corinth. Where's Corinth? Corinth was the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. We've just been thinking about Thessalonica, which was the Roman capital of the province of Macedonia. Um, so Macedonia, if you, if you were to look at what we think of as Greece, Macedonia was the region in the north. Um, it was the home of Philip of Macedon, who was Alexander the Great's father. And previously, before the rise of the Greek Empire, uh, Macedonia was separate from Greece, and they fought each other, and Philip won. But Macedonia then became a region of Greece, and then when the Romans beat the Greeks, it became a, a Roman province. And Thessalonica was its capital, but then the Roman province below that, which we think of as... Um, uh, northern Greece, I suppose you could say, with Athens in it, is a very significant part, and I'm just trying to remember what that was called, and I can't remember. Um, but then below that was the Peloponnesian uh, part of Greece, and so between the kind of northern part of Greece and the southern part of Greece, there's this little land bridge area which had Corinth in it. And now the Corinth was a very important city because it was um, on this little land bridge between the mainland of Greece, let's say, and the Peloponnesian part of Greece, that, which is just like a huge block. And when people wanted to trade between part in the south and go up to the mainland in the north, they had to cross over this little land bridge by land. But also at the same spot, 
there was, um, a, instead of digging a canal, which they've done now, the Corinthian Canal, um, instead of digging that, they used to take their ships and they, they'd pick up the ships out of the water and put them on great sleds, and then they'd push the, sli sl the, the ships on sleds, or they'd pull them on sleds, over the, that little narrow part of land. That was where Corinth was. So because it was the center of these two trade routes, one going north-south, one going east-west across the little land bridge, it was the center of all that trade for that whole area. And Corinth became like the most significant city in the whole country. Corinth became so rich and famous because of all the trade. Yes, your question. That's okay. So um, think about Corinth, you, you really need to think about London, the great city. It was, it was the city which had all the fantastic trade happening in it. It was big, it was busy, it was rich. It was terribly, terribly sinful, just like London. I, I called, when I started preaching through 1 Corinthians, I called Corinth first century Sodom because it was so full of wickedness, so full of sinful practices that were just normal, a bit like London, that it, it was almost like Sodom or Gomorrah. Um, and, and yet it was, it was the biggest and most significant city in the whole region. Now, uh, Athens was a little bit like Oxford is to London. A Athens was a sleepy town, um, small town full of philosopher philosophers, philosophers, um, Lon London rather. Uh, I mean, Corinth was full of all the trade giants of that day. Okay. And Paul went there with Silas and Timothy, and they got busy um, when, when, sorry, verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. So you can learn about this elsewhere, but Silas and Timothy brought Paul some money. So prior to that, Paul was busy um, doing tent making with Priscilla and, and Aquila. Um, and he joined them and, and they got busy making tents for a living. Why? Because he didn't have missionary support. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, they brought with them the missionary support and Paul didn't have to earn a living. And it says Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now, he was already busy, remember, reasoning in the synagogues and so on, and now he got, you would say, he went from being part-time busy to full-time busy. Um, and when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there, and went to the house of the man, of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Talk about how to, how to cause trouble. <laughs> Paul wasn't embarrassed, was he? He's like, I'm going to set up next door <laughs> to the synagogue because this guy's willing. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. So think of it, Crispus would have just like moved next door and now there's the synagogue with real Christian Jews in it and the synagogue with those who rejected the gospel in it next door. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, 
and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people, many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Wouldn't you have loved to be there for that eight, those 18 months and to be in the house of Titius Justus and listen to Paul teaching every day? Think of it. Every day having teaching from the Apostle Paul. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united ta attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is, a is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words, and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them out of the tribune tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Now Sosthenes um, may well be the same Sosthenes as another Sosthenes who, who crops up in the book of Corinthians. So um, maybe he was converted. Maybe he was converted after this. Maybe he was the ruler of the synagogue and he was against Paul and they beat him because they were embarrassed at having been humiliated in front of the in front of the proconsul, who was the Gallio, the, this Roman official, and they, they had tried to kind of do in Paul and Timothy and Silas, and it had backfired on them, and they'd been humiliated. So maybe that's why they beat Sosthenes, or maybe Sosthenes was already converted, and, and because they couldn't get hold of Paul and Timothy and mm -hmm. Uh, Silas and so on, they just grabbed, like they grabbed Jason and dragged him out of his house in Thessalonica. Maybe they just grabbed Sosthenes and beat him up instead. And Gallio paid no attention. He was like, oh, I don't care. It's just Jews fighting Jews. Well, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And you're like, what was that about? Okay, that was have been a, what kind of vow would it have been? A Nazarite vow. Do you remember the Nazarites? Remember they didn't cut their hair, like Samson? And they didn't touch alcohol. Why would Paul make a Nazarite vow? Well, I don't know, but he had. And then he cut his hair. Um, people speculate a lot about that. I'm assuming it was a Nazarite vow. Other people have said he, um, you know, the, the Jews in Corinth at that time very impressed with, um, you know, the, the way they kept their hair really short and he decided he was not going to cut his hair short as part of um, trying to kind of be different from the Jews in, in those days. And he, he was sort of vowing, just like he said, I didn't, in 1 Corinthians, I didn't come to you with words of you know, wisdom and eloquence and so on. Uh, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Some people have suggested that, but actually it's not really clear. But he was under a vow and he cut his hair. That we know. And they came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. 
And we're very glad because God did will. And um, we get the fact that the church in Ephesus was planted and Paul wrote the Ephes letters to the Ephesians. Um, when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Now you need a little line in your Bible at that point because the next verse, between verse 22 and verse 23, is the end of the second missionary journey of Paul and the beginning of the third missionary journey of Paul. Verse 23 says, After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples. It needed strength because it's always cold in Phrygia. Well, all right, that was a joke. Now, third missionary journey, we're talking about AD 53 to AD 56. Second missionary journey, AD 50 to 52. So it gives you an idea of timing. Um, this is exciting now because he's off. And whilst he's off, things get exciting in Ephesus. Look at verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ep Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And he, when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Mm. Now, let's get this straight. Apollos... I only knew the baptism of John, but he was mighty in the scriptures and he was preaching and teaching the way of God accurately, but then Priscilla and Aquila heard him and they thought, oh, he's not, you know what, he's accurate, but he's missing some bits. We need to teach him the way of God more accurately. And so they took him, and it's interesting because it's now it mentions Priscilla first, that's the woman first, and um, it seems like she's part of teaching a, a, um, Apollos the way of God more accurately. I believe this is a very, very helpful um, counterbalance to the biblical teaching that in the place of worship, a woman should remain silent. She shouldn't be exercising public speaking gifts in public, um, but there's nothing to stop a woman like Priscilla, there's nothing bad said about a woman like Priscilla in the privacy of a home environment being part of teaching Apollos the way of God more accurately. It's not right for a woman to, to teach or to exercise authority over a man in, in a public setting but it's not wrong for a woman to be involved in instructing someone um, to help them in a private setting like this. And so we, we praise God for an example like this. And, and it does help to, to know that in that personal setting of personal conversation where you're just helping someone to see things more accurately, it can free you up as a woman to speak freely to, to men who um, need to hear the Word of God, understand the Word of God more accurately. Don't be embarrassed to pass on what you know. Praise God for Priscilla, 
along with Aquila, helping to equip Apollos. And look at what happens to Apollos now. Verse 19, verse, chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through and um, passed through the inland country. Sorry, let, I can't show you what happened uh, to Apollos at this point because the, the story moves on. But if you go to Corinthians, you realize that Apollos had become like one of the great preachers in Corinth. On Corinthians, they were they were actually starting to kind of pit him against Paul. Some people were saying, I'm of Paul. Some people were saying, I'm of Apollos. Oh no, I'm of Cephas. That means Peter. Oh, I'm of Christ. Apollos became like a mighty preacher of the gospel. And Paul said, I planted and Apollos watered. That's a big job. So this is really, really good news. Priscilla and Aquila together. But now Priscilla, as I mentioned first, became the people who helped this servant of God to see things more accurately. What a blessing. Uh, what a blessing to the church came as a result of that. Now, it happened while, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There, he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Now, this is, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Apollos only knew the, knew the baptism of John. These disciples were only baptized into John's baptism. So, were these disciples disciples of Apollos? Actually, there's no way that you can say that. It's not in the text. I had to learn a painful lesson years ago when I was studying these passages, and I put two and two together and made five. You can't make five from two and two, can you? And I read these two passages, and I read them together, and I thought, oh, hey, presto, I'm beginning to understand that Apollos was teaching them, and Apollos didn't know about the baptism. Only Apollos only knew about but These must be disciples that Apollos had taught, and... Um, actually, that's not in the text. It was just in my head. Beware, 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 inserting your own thoughts into the text and making conclusions that are not actually um, derived from the text, but derived from your assumptions. Be careful of believing your assumptions. You have to learn to scrutinize the text and question your assumptions so that you only believe what the text says, not what you think it says, because you're making assumptions. Anyway, Paul said to these, apostles, these disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And you say, hold on a minute. Into what baptism were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who is coming after him. That is Jesus. And I think that's the summary, a very short summary of what Paul said. I think Paul preached Jesus to them because on hearing of the Lord Jesus, um, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, they heard about this, then they were baptized in response to Paul's message. Why would you baptize people again if they've been baptized with the baptism of John? Were they not truly believers? Oh, this is interesting, isn't it? So what's the situation of these disciples in... Ah, oh, now here's the question. They did not only not have the Holy Spirit, but they'd not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, you're like, oh, hang on a minute. How did they not hear that there even is a Holy Spirit 
if they were baptised with John's baptism because what was John's message? After, after me will come one who will baptise, I baptise you with water. After me comes one who will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And you're like, well, that was like central to John's message. Well, they didn't have a very good, clear understanding of John's message if they didn't understand that after John would come Jesus and he would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. I don't think these were true believers. They were disciples, but they were followers of John's baptism. These were people who had not quite got the gospel right. So they needed to be saved. They had heard the message of John up to a point, but they, they hadn't heard the message of John adequately. Now, Apollos is a different category, isn't it? He, he was preaching and teaching accurately, but he needed more information. What was he missing, you say? Well, we don't know, but Priscilla and Aquila made up whatever John, whatever Apollos was missing, so that now he could preach more accurately, so you'd say more completely, the, the message, so that it was, it was okay now, because it wasn't missing anything. These, there's no mention of Apollos needing to be baptized. Uh, Apollos just gets taught the way of God more accurately, and off he goes, commended by the church. Boom, okay, we, you're good now. Um, these disciples, hang on a minute, they haven't got it straight at all. They're not even saved. They haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, no mention of that with Apollos. He's just, his preaching is fixed. He's got the baptism of John He's obviously got the baptism of John right. His preaching is fixed up so that he's got the bits of information that he's missing. And off you go, Apollos, as a preacher of the Christian message. Great. Praise the Lord. These guys, they haven't got it right. They've, not, they've, heard, they've had John's baptism, but they haven't even got the fact there's a Holy Spirit. Now what happens to them? On hearing this, they were baptized in in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Now, stop this for a second. Um, every incident in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit falls upon people like this, is an indication of one, two, two things. One is, it shows that, that that people group are being added into the church. So at Pentecost, the Jews who were converted at Pentecost were added into the church. Um, in Samaria, the Samaritans who received the word were ad added into the church. In Cornelius' house, the Gentiles who received the word of God and repented and were baptized were added into the church. It also shows that those people were not yet saved. The Jews at Pentecost were not yet saved, were they? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They repented, they believed, they were baptized, they received the Holy Spirit. This was an outpouring of the, the Holy Spirit upon a new people group. It was a mighty work of God. A, so, the, so the outpouring of the Spirit was given at a moment when um, a new people group were being brought in. Try and open your eyes. Keep, it, keep, keep on going, my dear. We're nearly there. A, a new people group were being brought into the, to the church. All right, now this is final people group. Well, what's this? What's going on here? 
Well, these, these people represent what must have been loads of people all over the Roman Empire who'd heard the message of John, kind of badly taught. Are you tired? Are you falling asleep? Is that the problem? Okay. We'll go down to the seven sons of Sceva and let you go. And you can, um, you can get the rest of the recording tomorrow. Hang on in there for one minute more. These, bap no, don't start counting. <laughs> These people who had received the baptism of John, think of it, all over the, the Roman Empire, the message of John the Baptist would have gone out. There were going to be some people like these people who hadn't even got the message of John the Baptist straight. So there were those who did get the message of John the Baptist straight and who had believed in the who had truly trusted in the one coming after him, that is the Messiah. John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet, the last of them, and he was pointing forwards to the coming of Jesus, wasn't he? So people who truly believed John's message and understood it and repented and were baptized, they would be saved. And they'd be believing in the coming Messiah. But there were lots of people who didn't get John's message properly. Either they didn't hear it adequately um, or they misunderstood it, but they had been baptized with the baptism of John. Someone had gone and baptized them. Lots of people, remember, or like all Judea were going out to him to be baptized. But then that message spread around the world. There was a whole group of people, you could say, who had had John's baptism. Now the question remains, do they need to be saved if they haven't? You know, I've been baptized with John's baptism. Yeah, good. Well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? No. What? So you need to. You need to. You need the message of Jesus. You need. The, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. You you ain't got it yet. Sorry. And then they're baptized, and you could say, boom, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them, and it's shown to everybody clearly that they too need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't be saved until you are truly indwelled by the Holy Spirit. This is, this is a whole new reality in the New Testament. Praise the Lord for it. Well, uh, Paulus, verse, uh, sorry, Paul, verse 8, he entered the synagogue for, and for three months spoke boldly and reasoning and reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now Ephesus where Paul is now, is in what we call modern-day Turkey. So Paul's crossed over from Greece in Corinth. He's gone over, he's now in Ephesus. And this is um, the third missionary journey, and he's um, doing the same thing he did in Corinth, and he's um, busy teaching daily and building up the church. All right, Karis, I'm going to let you go up and get ready for bed because you're falling asleep and you can catch the recording and catch up on it tomorrow. We're going to carry on. We'll say good night. Don't forget to wave at your friends as you go and don't kick the camera. And now it gets exciting. Now Karis is going. She'll have to catch this tomorrow. <laughs> well, you wanted to go to bed, didn't you? You can stay if you want. It's going to be a riot. And there's going to be some devils. You want to stay? Quick decision. You're going to look forward to it tomorrow. All right. Go and get ready for bed. 
And God was doing extraordinary miracles, verse 11, by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away and to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And that backfired on that demon, didn't it? And many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. It's interesting, isn't it? I wonder if there was a Judas in that group that said, this should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Anyway, these people were not interested in that. They wanted to get rid of their magic scrolls. Uh, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now, um, here's a little side note, which is interesting, isn't it? Um, I'm going to be talking about this on Sunday. The name of Jesus is not a magic formula. What do I mean by that? Um, some people treat the, the phrase, in Jesus' name, or, you know, I command you in the name of Jesus, as some kind of magic formula that demons have to be afraid of. It's not. It's not. These Jewish ex exorcists thought that that's how it worked. They thought that somehow they could do this thing where Paul and others were casting out demons when they did. Um, uh, it, you know, with... <sighs> excuse me, with the power of God associated with the na name and the work of Christ. And so these Jewish exorcists kind of locked onto that, thought, ah, oh, okay, now we know what to do. We can, we can cast out demons in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus isn't a magic phrase. It doesn't have power in and of itself. What about... Why do I say that? Well, because that's how people treat it. I've even heard um, otherwise great people saying, look, one of the ways to tell if someone is demon-possessed is to see how they respond to the name of Jesus. If they can't stand the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then they're probably demon possessed if if they're not in not if they don't visibly contort their faces or get angry at the mention of the name of Jesus then maybe they're just mentally ill and not demon possessed um that kind of thinking uh, as much as it came from the lips of someone i admire tremendously who's now with the lord himself um I, I, I admire that man more than more than most people. Um, but uh, as much as as much as some great people have said that kind of thing, really doesn't make sense, sense biblically, does it? The devil can appear as an angel of light, 
If the devil can appear as an angel of light, you can't frighten the devil with the name of the Lord Jesus. Here are these people. This is the puts the lie to that idea. Here are these people who are being told to get out in the name of Jesus, and they just say, "Stuff you." <laughs> We, we know Paul and we rec we know Jesus, but who are you? Uh, no, actually, there was power given by the Lord to certain apostles and certain disciples in the early church. And they had power. They were given power to cast out demons. And they did it in Jesus' name. But they, they were actually entrusted with power. It was a gift of the power to, to, to cast out demons. And, and so we, we, can't, um, we can't look at what they did and imitate what they did and you know, think that we necessarily are going to have the same power. No. They're... Um, uh, that 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 gift of being able to cast out demons, I believe, was a New Testament gift, but I don't believe that that is um, something that every believer naturally has. Or, I mean, if I were to come across someone who I believed was possessed by demons, um, I, I would pray. I would pray like crazy. <laughs> I would pray trusting that the Lord is able to deal with that demon today just as well as he was able to deal with demons in New Testament times. I'm not suggesting that demons, demon possession doesn't happen. I'm not suggesting that the Lord cannot cast out demons. The Lord can. Um, but I, I would just caution tremendously about assuming that the phrase in the name of Jesus is a, like a magic phrase that has power in and of itself. I think this passage gives the lie to that. Anyway, um, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So Asia's across the water in Turkey, um, what we call modern-day Turkey, Ephesus, that region. Uh, Macedonia and Achaia are in modern-day Greece. I'm doing it the wrong way around. I'm doing it my way around. So for you, it's going to be uh, Asia, over here in Turkey, and then back over here in what is now Greece, um, Macedonia, and Achaia. Um, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but almost in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. It's interesting how they summarize his message, isn't it? And there is, a there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. 
Now, are you, are you getting a theme here? It was pretty dangerous, wasn't it, to hang around with Paul? I mean, poor old Jason got dragged out of his home. And this Sosthenes, whether or not he was converted at that point, it's not clear. And there was Sosthenes that was beaten in front of Gallio, the proconsul. And now this poor old um, uh, Gaius and Aristarchus. Uh, but when Paul wished to go into the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theatre. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they'd come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, went to make a defence to the crowd. But when they recognised that he was a Jew for about two hours... They all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. When the town clerk had quietened the crowd, he said, Man of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is a temple, is temple keeper of the great Artemis, and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then these things that cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here whom are neither sacrilegious, who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are, really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when the, he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. And Paul and the rest of them said, Phew! <laughs> what, a, what a day, a day in the life of Paul. It almost feels as though Paul must have thought at the end of each day, what, Oh, good. Well, we got through another day without a riot. It was it was a pretty good day. You know? <laughs> I feel sometimes when we preach the gospel that it's like firing blanks. And I look at Paul and these guys, and they they had bullets in their gun, didn't they? They they fired they fired live ammunition, and it stirred up things. Pray for us that the gospel would have an impact. I would rather see a riot than apathy. You'd rather have people angry at you as a, as a preacher. I'd rather have people furious with me, having understood what I'm saying, than I would have people just kind of go, huh. Um, that said, I don't particularly like the idea of rioting people. It doesn't seem like I wouldn't, wouldn't consider this fun. It, it must be terrifying, utterly terrifying. But, but you have to say God was at work, don't you? What an amazing time in the life of the church. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would be faithful. And whatever you call us to, that we would f faithfully communicate your word. And Lord, we pray that you would save the lost. We pray that you would raise up laborers who will preach the word in season and out of season. And Lord, that your, your people who are elect from before the foundations of the world, you would save and add into your church. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, we are done. God bless you. I'm going to turn off the camera since there's no camera queen around. I'll leave Donna to wave. <laughs>